how do we go about changing at least the perception that, uh, that, the, that business and activism are opposites? Those people were business people, they were CEOs, they were owners, they were founders, they were employees and they were holding placards and waving banners, stood outside demanding no new fossil fuels. So this concept that business and activism don't fit together isn't quite right. How are we supposed to, to get these two really opposing sides to, to be, to be uh, talking and collaborating? We mobilise against the common challenge, which is the existential threat of the climate, ecological and social breakdown. And I would generally come back to people who have got children, who have got nieces and nephews. Um, do you not surely look at them? Do you not surely look at them and want them to have a better life? How do you deal with those conversations in, in businesses? But the point that I think businesses or a lot of us are missing is that and that's the science, that's the fact, because there's an existential threat coming down the line. You know, this is, this is a war effort that we need, a martial plan that we need, and we have to put aside political differences, ideological differences, business versus academics versus anyone else. How do we, how do we get people to, to think differently? Hi, I'm Chris Caldwell, and welcome to season three of Conversations on Climate. So ben, thank you so much for, for taking the time to come here and join us to talk about these really important topics like business declares, corporate act activism, um, you know, climate assemblies, and an awful lot more. Uh, yeah, but before we, we jump in, I would like to get a kind of a sense of like, well, what got you here in the first place? Like you had in 2019, you had uh, a, a serious left turn. Could you give a little, little bit of background into that and uh, how it all uh, came about? Yeah, of course. And Chris, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, um, if we think back to 2018, it was the rise of Extinction Rebellion. The whole concept of the climate, ecological and social crisis was really raised up the agenda to a level that, that we've never seen before. So there was a kind of zeitgeist around 2018 and then early 2019, uh, the UK government signed the um, declaration of climate emergency. So this is a context in which I suppose my story begins. Um, and it was one day in February 2019 when I uh, got out the tube at Canary Wharf, just down the road from here, and we'd had three days of 20 degrees in February and all of the news, all of the kind of vibe was hugely positive. This is fantastic, another scorcher, what we're going to do on the weekend, great news. And I just watched everyone at Canary Wharf scuttling around, went into my office in Bank Street, the BBC news was on, great news, another scorcher. And I just stood there and I said, no, this isn't great news. How can it be great news? How can it be good to have 20 degrees in February? So I did a lot of research. Um, the NASA website is great for the, for the climate research back, back then. There's a lot more resources now. And I educated myself. And I learned the truth, or at least some of the truth. Um, and at that point, my, my kind of moment changed, I suppose, forever. Um, I tried to influence from within. I ran a series of lunch and learns for, for the teams, um, which were really well attended. And I guess I kind of hit a wall at some point um, where I felt that I wasn't really bringing my authentic self to work. So I looked around for networks and organisations that I might find helpful. Business Declares was one of those, and we'll talk about those, that, that later. So I got involved in Business Declares whilst I was in a full-time role. And then it got to a point where I just felt that I, I, you know, this is inauthentic to, to turn up and do stuff which is counter to what needs to be done. So in 2020, um, I actually quit, and in 2021, I actually left full-time employment from there. And the thing, the two questions that stick in my mind were, I was 50 then, and I said, well, if 50 is now, and say 70 is old, and apologies, I'm not being uh, ageist here, but I had to pick an age, what do I want to do for 20 years? Do I want to do more of this? I've already done 25 years in corporate life. I'm finding it challenging given what's happening in the world um, and I want to do something different and then, then secondly more more fundamentally what do I say to my daughter what do I say to the younger generation in 10 years time in 15 years time when they say you knew this was happening and what did you do about it so those two things stuck in my mind as a real 
drive to, to, to do something different and, and to try and, I guess, do something good with regards to climate, ecological and social crisis. Great. Yeah, that's, that's what really resonates with me. I've got a very kind of sim similar enough experience as we um, you know, I went along. But um, it kind of, before we kind of we dig deeply, more deeply into the, the climate side of it, so I think we'd be, be interested to discuss kind of briefly the more um, kind of social side, because um, like the current crisis that we're in is both a crisis of climates and um, you know, changing changing biodiversity and uh, the, you know, the planetary crisis, but also a, a massive challenge in, um, in society. Like we need to be re-looking at several norms, uh, sort of several ways ways that we, we think about things. Um, one of the big changes that, that you made there um, is uh, giving up a job. And in society, jobs tend to be very much associated with your identity. Like, you know, one of the first questions you get asked when you ask, oh, so what, so what do you do? Um, how was that for you? Like, how did you, did, how did you get your, did your sense of identity change uh, dramatically? So firstly, Chris, just to be really clear, um, I recognise a massive privilege mm. I had to give up a well-paid job and, you know, many, many people are not in that position. So I just, just put that out there. I will also say though, there are many people who are in that position and choose not to. So just, just to counter that. It took me about 18 months to work my, work my way through that, that very question because, as, as you rightly say, and from what I've observed of 25 years of corporate life, your identity gets tied up in your job so much that you, you can't disassociate from your job. And when you ask, who am I and what am I, um, you, you in, invariably go to your career. Um, and I struggled with that. And I also had, obviously, the trappings of being a senior person in a senior role and all that comes with that and, and, and leaving all that behind. And who was I if I wasn't that? So it took me about 18 months to get my head around that. Um, and I think I, I kind of fell back on the concept that acting with values, even if you're not sure about what that, those actions are and whether they will work, but acting with values has to be the kind of North Star, the cornerstone um, of what you do. So I sort of ended up taking, I guess, a little bit of a leap but I also joined Business Declares and met loads of other people whilst I was in paid employment. So that transition was kind of quite smooth in the end, although I didn't realise it at the time. So, so I've now, I've gone through that identity change. I'm, I'm a completely different person and, and I've got so much more freedom, so much more motivated, the, the, the kind of purpose-led ethos. And because I'm um, able to speak truth and speak truth to power, whereas before you have to check with your corporate PR and comms people, um, that sense of freedom and, and relief and, and autonomy is, is, is massive. So yes, been through that identity crisis and I've kind of come out the other side. Amazing. Um, and you, seem, you say that you're a completely different person. Well, what do you mean by that? Um, well, I think more about, um, Le less about the trappings of, of wealth, of, of career progression, of consumption, of um, what do people think, um, and all those kind of deep commercial, industrial commercial consumption things, and much more, I guess, emotionally connected with the planet, with the future generation, with nature, and almost seeing things through a completely different lens and, and, and actually much more at one with myself because getting rid of those trappings also means getting rid of a lot of stress and a lot of stuff that you really don't need to worry about and getting much more you know, d down into the, into the important things in life, which is, which is you know, people, planet, and, and doing the right thing. So, so, so that's the kind of feeling and the kind of actions that I'm, I'm taking. Great. And have you found, like I'm sure that there's quite a lot of people there who'd be sitting there going, oh, that sounds great, and might be kind of you know, tremendously jealous of you. But you might find other people sitting out there going, oh, what are we doing, throwing away so much, so much, um, so much, so much work and effort to get to a point, um, throw it all away, it would kill to get to get to that position. Um, have you found kind of society at large, like people, people that you meet have, have reacted to someone who is, who just so, quite so kind of defies norms? Mm. Yeah, I think that probably falls into three categories. So there's one category of people who think I was absolutely lost the plot. Uh, my peers, you know, would say, hang on, you're 50, you're on the board of the, the world's biggest property and asset management company. You've got opportunities 
galore and you've thrown it all in for, for what exactly? Um, and I'm sure there are clients and there were people outside with, with the same kind of view. So that you've got that, that sort of bunch of people. Then you've got people who I know because they've written to me in the corporate world who have said, you know, my God, um, that's amazing. That's so inspirational. I can't believe what you've done. It's, it's, you know, it's exactly the right things to do. And I like to think that they've done, they've changed in some way as a result of that, not packed in their job, but maybe done some other things. And then the third bunch of people is those that I've met subsequently um, in the not-for-profit sector, the activism sector, who have been so welcoming and engaging and um, helped me to transition into a different style of, of working and a different style of being. So, so yes, a very different spread of views for sure. Um, and Okay, so just, just for clarity, you are um, now working without a salary, okay, 100%, yeah. Um, it's really interesting because like, the way that business would tend to frame um, people's work, people's, people's value, really, mm -hmm. uh, the, the value of their work and the value of, of them as, you know, as, as individuals turning, turning up on a daily basis is, is cash. Um, it's, a, it's about how, how much you're paid. Um, what has your experience of being in a, um, a non-paid you know, set of work, um, what, what has that taught you about that particular frame of, of, of business towards money? Yeah, I mean, I, I challenge the question slightly. So, mm. so first of all, it's some businesses and some people that value cash and title, mm. uh, and particularly here in the heart of the financial uh, district, <laughs> of course it is, but that is not universal across businesses. So let, let's be clear about that. And, and secondly, um, intrinsic motivation um, is not derived from money once you reach a certain level. So all the research shows you that the sort of satisfaction with your job um, is not linked to pay after a certain level. What motivates people in my experience of 25 years in corporate life is being able to do a good job, being able to feel they're making a difference, being valued and working with people who they you know, love working with and, and, and get on with. So this, this whole idea of money is the only motivation, I, I don't think is right. That said, um, there is a kind of power uh, desire amongst certain people and power and money kind of come together. So, so there is a sort of proxy link there. So, so I would say that it's, it's not necessarily uh, linked and um, not everybody does think like that. Um, does that answer your question? I can't remember the last bit of it. Sure, that's, yeah, that's great. Well, just as a follow-on then, is there anything that you missed from that, that world? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't. So um, the monthly paycheck um, that doesn't land, um, you know, I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss that kind of comfort. Um, also the fact that I had big teams, so I did have some power. Um, and I was able to get things done. I had a lot of resource. I don't have that anymore. And I have to be completely different in a not-for-profit world, which I've, I've loved and embraced. But there are times when I want to get stuff done faster and I you know, don't have those levers of power. And then IT, the IT departments, to every IT department out there, I'd like to say a big thank you. Because when my IT goes wrong now, it's all on me, right? And in all the other days, the IT guys would just fix it. So uh, they are the unsung heroes of the corporate world. Control, alt, delete. Problem <laughs> solved. <laughs> You mentioned there that you had a kind of a, a moment in time said so like you were 50 and you thought well I got tw you got 20 years to try and make make an impact. Um, there's kind of a, an echo there towards the kind of the, the climate crisis and towards the you know what we're what we're facing ahead of us. Um, we have basically about 20 years left to make an awful lot of to make to make a serious change. Um, do you think that we're from where we are now, um, that we've we've left it too late, that it it is too late. So are we too kind of our our attitudes uh, too baked in so that we can actually make the the type of impact over the next twenty years that you're trying to make? Yeah. Again, I, I might just push back on your question slightly. Mm. Too too late for what does too late mean? Too late for what and whom? Because this is a this is a sort of binary phrase that we hear a lot out there. What what do, what do we mean by too late? What do you mean by too late? Well, um, 
I would say one of the biggest obvious points are like up climatic tipping points. Like, are we mm -hmm. can, can we can we prevent enough carbon going into the atmosphere that will stop us stop the, the rainforest turning to savanna, stop melting of of the, of the poles? Yeah. You know, sort of things that we we literally we cannot come back from that will take 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 yeah. you know generations to to uh, to, to solve. Um, and the path that we're going on now, where if we're year after year, we put more carbon and carbon into the atmosphere, um, it seems like we're getting to the point where we are, unless dramatic action is taken, we are too late. And looking around, society does seem to be resistant to make the changes that we would need to, to prevent that type of you know, cataclysmic event, those types of cataclysmic events in, on our planet uh, occurring. That's what, what I mean by that. Yeah, okay. So, so let's, let's just pick that apart in different, mm -hmm. different ways. So. Um, there is a lot of warming baked in today. Alrighty. So if we stopped burning all fossil fuels today and we restored nature beautifully today, we would still have increases in temperature way beyond, well, certainly 1.5 because we've already gone past yeah. 1.5. But, but way yeah. So there is, stuff, there is stuff baked in. So is it too late to stop stuff that was, is already baked in? Absolutely yes. You know, the science is, is pretty clear. Kevin Anderson, Bill Maguire, James Hansen, you know, that it, it's all there. So warming will happen and things will get worse, even if, even if we stopped the entire global economy today, right? That's just fact. Um, the question is, is not, is it bad? The question is, how bad will it be? And this is where we do have some mastery over our destiny, I think. Um, I would also say that if we think we can grow global GDP infinitely year on year and maintain the lifestyles that we've got in the global north, uh, the rich in the global north, um, that cannot happen um, because it's a biophysical impossibility. There is not enough resources in there. So have, have we, have, is it possible to carry on as we're doing in the global north? Uh, no, it isn't. Um, is it possible to um, improve or, or have less bad consequences in later years for our children and everybody else? Uh, yes, it is. It is possible. It is possible to, to have less bad consequences. The problem I've got, though, is if you look at two, two factors today, the banks, the big banks are continuing to pour billions of dollars into fossil fuel licensing. Um, JP Morgan and uh, Bank of Canada being the big ones and, and here in, in Europe, Barclays and HSBC. They are continuing to pour billions into fossil fuel licensing, even though they know the consequences for our children and everyone else and the global south and all living species is dire. On top of that, Governments, the UK government has just issued 100 fossil fuel license, licenses for drilling, even though that's counter to the science, counter to their own climate um, advisory team, counter to the UN, counter to the IEA. So yes, we can make things less bad, but if the government and the banks are acting in the exact opposite way, it doesn't really give us a lot of chance. And there's a lot of good businesses trying to do the right thing out there trying to make things less bad for the future but how are they how are they gonna overcome the obstacles of government and banks going in completely the other direction that's a problem that we've got today um, and we've got to find a way of moving out of this growth and investment in fossil fuels and consumption find a new economic model we've got to find a new economic model or else we won't make things better in the longer term for the future for our children and others mm -hmm. yeah yeah 100 percent um it's a really hard thing to do though uh, like trying to break down those systems like with the sheer wealth behind um, fossil fuel industry and you know Dave was um, just listening to um, to Al Gore talk about um, how many governments around the world were were um, heavily influenced <laughs> by the mm -hmm. uh, by, by the by the dollars of the fossil fuel industry and individual governments whatever he wasn't making specific allegations with the UK although he did have a nod in that direction going yeah. so well done Mr Gore um, uh, Vice President Gore but 
It's very easy for people to get uh, get negative, like in in the context of seeing seeing your government, seeing your major institutions all being all going in the wrong direction. But you 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 you're showing a real determination and a real real kind of you know, strength strength and fight. What do you say to people who who feel kind of that it's impossible? Who feel who feel kind of overwhelmed by the by the by the battle that's ahead? The first thing I'd say is recognize the feeling in yourself and kind of just sit with that feeling and, and discuss that feeling with, with people. So don't bottle stuff up. That's kind of the worst thing you can do. So just kind of let, let that feeling out. Um, I would also say, talk to people. There is so many great people out there, so many like, like-minded people out there from which I derive kind of most of my energy, quite frankly, um, who are all striving to do the right thing. There is a lot of goodness out there. I would say, know that you're on the right side of history. Know that you're on the right side of history by um, changing the course of your action. And as we see with activists in, in time, they're often um, demonized at the time and then eulogized later on for what they did. So know that you're on that, that right side of history. Um, and take, take courage, take courage in that and find your tribe, find your tribe because they're there and a whole world of possibilities and uh, enthusiasm and drive and passion will will be awoken once you found them. Mm, love it. Um, so move from the tribe to uh, to businesses and uh, something that is it sounds it sounds a bit of a contradiction term perhaps an oxymoron to some but business activism. Um, could you describe like what it's, it's obviously what you're spending your your work on now spending spending your time on now is uh, business activism tell us what what is business activism for a start yeah so the whole term activism of course has been massively politicized and sort of demonized particularly by the press and, and remember that you know of the national newspapers uh, three quarters of the circulation is owned by four families so so you know this whole activism term conjures up all kinds of things let's not let's not go into all the things they are but we all know what they are so for me i would define activism as it's got to be an act which is notable and visible and, 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 and focused on a change, some kind of change. So, so that is a component. Another component is it's an act in service of life, which is um, beyond uh, your own um, self-interest. And another uh, component is something probably that makes you feel a bit awkward and a bit uncomfortable, and I feel that a lot, right? Um, so these, these are three things which are the sort of essence for me of, of activism. And you can apply them obviously in a personal way or in a business way. And I can talk about lots of different uh, examples of business activism should, should you wish. But the, these, are the, these are the three things. And, and remember from recent surveys, the Kite survey, that the, they um, interviewed thousands of people and something like 80% of employees said they want to take action on climate because they're so concerned about it. And the Deloitte CEO survey that said, when employees uh, make a noise and drive companies to do something differently, companies do change. So make no mistake about it, business activism is alive and kicking and real and it's growing, it's growing by the day because people do not want to be in a business that is funding and driving their demise, their children's demise and other people's demise. But one of the constructs of the modern economy is the sense of the of corporate's identity corporate equivalent like the corporate um, as an as an entity in itself um, and that entity itself um, has the hardwiring of it being a entirely selfish <laughs> self-absorbed unit that it only cares about its own its own kind of profitability um, and yes there are individuals who are then in paid service of this of the, this entity um, but the entity itself is it, it, it's slightly psychotic. Um, how does that fit? How does corporate activism fit within within um, the idea that a a business is an entity in itself and not just a, a sum of individuals? So I think there's some really good examples of this. Um, if we take someone like Faith in Nature, they they have uh, reshaped their legals their legal structure to put nature on the board. So they have a a specific. Um, process in their board meetings that says what would nature say um, and that has the the power to challenge all profit market share and normal commercial metrics in in there so this this creates a, a sort of 
entity that's also disrupting uh, legal entity terms. Also, the Better Business Act is, is another example of, of, of legal changes. You've got someone like Fairphone. Fairphone decided that they would not go with built-in obsolescence on mobile phones like the, the, the usual providers, and all of the parts are able to be taken out, to be repaired, to be replaced, etc. That, that will impact their profit. OK, um, so that level of that that level of entity, because because people don't need to buy a new one, they just need to buy a new part. Same with Patagonia. You know, they repair coats for free um, instead of selling you another one. So this concept of bringing bringing the entity as a as a disruptive stroke activist type business thing is, again, is out there and growing. The problem is a lot of these things don't get reported because they're not necessarily very popular to be reported on in different sort of business spheres um, and I guess some businesses don't really want to embrace some of this stuff because it will affect their, their bottom line. Toast Ale for example do not export their beer for carbon reasons. So there are examples of entities who are taking a kind of more activist disruptive and you know, losing profit as a result, but they're doing the right thing. They're acting with values, and acting with values is, is really where we're heading in, in this world, particularly on Gen Zs and particularly younger people who do not want to work for companies who are funding their demise. Yeah, yeah. but uh, like Patagonia is a really good example of a firm that has that is doing a fundamentally a, an awful lot of good, but is also benefiting massively from doing it. It's like mm -hmm. it is arguably the most respected brand in the world now like like from both and both sides of the political spectrum in in the US both look at Patagonia you, you would think that this is something that would be deeply divisive like like chick-fil-a is a very well thought of brand overall but it's very much in one part of the the demographic um, as opposed to Patagonia which does manage to manage to straddle 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 both uh, sides of the, the political divide um, is there a Inconsistency uh, between doing uh, between doing things that may, on its surface, appear to be um, unprofitable or, or minimizing profits, um, but actually could have a benefit in terms of in, in other ways. Because like you're seen to be on the right side of history, as you say, yeah. and and will people people may then support you afterwards. Yes, there is an inherent inconsistency between the the business world of growth and you know, the, 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 the new economic model that we need that doesn't support growth, right? And we need to call that out and we need to voice that and we need to not be shy about that. There is an inconsistency, right? Let's, let's be clear. But no one's perfect and we shouldn't beat ourselves up about it. Can we do the least worst thing or the, or the best thing for people and planet whilst still having a business that we choose to not go down certain routes, not make certain choices, even though they would improve the business, um, but they will have a have a negative effect somewhere else. So yeah, I mean, we should we should call that out. But but you know, we are stuck in an economic model where we're told by all the politicians that growth is is the thing. Um, that's what all the MBA textbooks say you should do, um, and it just simply is not possible on a finite planet. And that's the inherent contradiction that we are stuck in right now. And there is no easy answer to that. Mm, for sure. Another inherent, inherent contradiction is uh, business and activism. Because you, the typical framing are that these two things are are, are in conflict. Mm -hmm. Like you know, you have you have businesses and you have activists sitting outside it with placards. You know, that's how, how do we go about changing at least the perception that uh, that the, that business and activism are are, are two to, are, are opposites. Well, again, I would I would challenge that slightly because the the popular narrative in the media, uh, which as I said before, you know, three quarters of the press is controlled by four families. Um, is that business and activism are opposing uh, things that they're not they're not necessarily let, let me give you i've given you some examples of businesses but let me give you an example of a couple of events so uh last year there was an event called the big one in london a hundred thousand people came um and at business declares we organized for about 300 businesses to come and picket the department of energy and net zero uh, in victoria in london those people were business people, they were CEOs, they were owners, they were founders, they were employees and they were holding placards and waving banners, stood outside, demanding no new fossil fuels. Um, 
We also created uh, an action called the, the Q for Climate and Nature, where 300 business leaders filled the Millennium Bridge, signed an open letter, which we delivered to Chris Skidmore, who was at the time the, the Tory MP, and Ed Miliband from Labour. We presented that, that, the, those letters to them. That letter got into several thousands of signatures, signatories. But on the day, there were 300 business leaders, all in suits, all stood on the Millennium Bridge, all signing a letter at the end of it. So this concept that business and activism don't fit together isn't quite right. Don't, don't believe what, what you're told. Look, look at some examples of what's, what's going on out there and, you know, this is gaining more and more traction and will do so as things get worse in 2024 and beyond. Hmm. How do we break out of the, um, the grip of then the, the pop, those four families, the popular press? That's a whole other question <laughs> for, for another time. But what I would say is one of the tools for that is for businesses to use their voice and use their voice so much more effectively, lobbying the government, lobbying their um, bodies that they're part of. Where is the IOD, the Institute of Directors in all of this? Where is the CBI? Where, what, are you, what, what are you guys saying, right? And why are you not saying it? So we need businesses to get their voice heard much more deeply and much more vociferously than they have done. The problem is, this is what I encounter all the time, there's this awkwardness. Oh no, I better not do that, I better not say that, because it might be seen as political. I mean, we're an existential threat here. This is not a political situation. This is an existential threat. So there's still this ingrained culture in many businesses that you better keep quiet, keep, you know, don't go to any of that, keep, keep, keep the noise down. And we need to get over that. We need to get over that, right? Think that we don't have time to do that. We just have to be bold and take that step. So business getting their voice heard is probably the best way of breaking out of the misconception that we read in the papers and getting governments uh, and other businesses to, to act differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just going back down into like the component parts of the businesses for a moment, so like the, the, the employees, the individuals within there. Um, there is a like you you have been doing some doing some work on the rights of individuals within an organization to be going out and and to be having the, having their own voices heard um uh, with a a charter you know mm -hmm. that says you know this is this is how you should be doing it Can you tell us a little bit about kind of the best practices that you you see for for that firm should be um not kind of constraining, but allowing within kind of certain boundaries of uh, individual activism? Yeah, it's a really good question, Chris. And we looked at this last year. And what, what we've got um, is a policy, which you can download from businessdeclares.com. And that policy is a, is a blueprint, if you like. And, and that policy is for employers and employees. And it covers scenarios like, what if I want to go on a climate march? Mm -hmm. What if I go on a climate march and I get arrested? Yeah. What if I get charged? What if I go to prison? So what should the employer's policy and reaction be to that? And how should they or shouldn't they instruct their staff about what to do? So we have a blueprint that you can download that answers all of those questions. Um, and organizations can take what they want or what they don't want and use that as a prototype for their, we call it the NVDA, Nonviolent Director Action Policy. Key stipulations are anything on this protest has to be non-violent. Um, staff have to do the non-violent training and also they have to make sure that when they're not at work, they, they make provision uh, so that they're, they're not putting undue pressure on their team. So there's some, some limits uh, in there, I guess. But, but this, is, this has been looked at by lawyers, it's been looked at by HR professionals, and it's, and it's a great resource to, to, to download. Has anybody used it? Is it there uh, in, in, in anger? No. Um, there is one organisation, uh, Whole Grain Digital, I'll call them out, for having, um, as far as I'm aware, the, the first sort of meaty policy on this. What happens is by the time the company's lawyers get, get hold of it, they, they instruct the board that um, all of the negative things that will come out of having this sort of policy, but they kind of forget the positives. And one of the positives is the war for talent. If organisations don't have some sort of policy on protest and climate protest and action, then people will leave. And if people leave, they'll be a lot worse off with profit and risk than they were if they stayed. So this is something that organisations have to have the courage to, to, to kind of look at and take on board. Mm. Well, it's enormously depressing that they need to have the courage to take it on board because it should not be something that requires courage. You should be able to stand up and protest and non-violently protest as you so wish. Mm. You should not be arrested for having a bike lock with you. It is 
ridiculous. <laughs> but anyway, it's another point. <laughs> but anyway, so if we move to, to Business of Clares, um, could you tell us a little bit about, about Business of Clares as an organisation? Yeah, sure. So Business of Clares was set up in 2019. Um, it's a network of businesses. Um, some of the big businesses in there include big names like the Financial Times, Trialist Bank, Riverford Organics, Cafe Direct. We also have a whole host of smaller businesses, B Corporations. Our mission really is to help businesses accelerate their plans to tackle the climate, ecological and social crisis. And we do it really, I guess, in three ways. N number one is sharing good practice. So creating a network where businesses can help each other, learn off each other on different bits of good practice. So whether it's how do I measure my scope one, two or three emissions or what actions do I take uh, once I've measured them, that, that kind of thing. The second thing we do is to uh, convene conversations on difficult topics. So two good examples is degrowth and activism, where we've run events with members, we've run events at national uh, sustainability uh, events, talking about those, those two topics. And there are other topics in there as well. And then the third thing we do is we amplify campaigns. Those campaigns could be ours, and I talked about um, the queue for climate and nature and Millennium Bridge. Uh, those campaigns could be others, and we've worked closely with the likes of Make My Money Matter on their campaigns uh, to do with the, 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 big, uh, the big banks and, and where they're putting their money. So it's a, it's a free to join network, and we try to provide those three types of services. We've got about 140 members now. Our objective is not to have hundreds of members. Our objective is to have an authentic set of businesses who genuinely want to do the right thing. And if it ends up being just 140 or if it drops to 100, so be it. We're not here to, to, to grow to huge numbers. It needs to be authentic. So that, that's what we've kind of created. Okay, and what are the key asks you, you make of members? So we've got a number of commitments. You, you don't just join and, and, and that's that. So the first thing you have to do is publicly declare a climate, ecological and social emergency publicly. That goes on your website, that goes to all your staff. If you're not prepared to stand up and be counted publicly, then don't join. Um, we also ask that you provide uh, climate plans of stuff that you're doing that will not just cover carbon, but also cover nature as well. Um, and we also uh, ask that you take part in conversations and follow-up meetings so that we can understand how the progress is going and, and where it's going, where you're finding difficulties. So there is a kind of set of requirements on those businesses um, which we do our best to uh, you know, help them with and look after and, and make sure they're, they're doing what, what they say they're doing. Fair enough. And if I could be a little challenging here, like one thing that's greenwashers mm -hmm. and and business players have in common is the declaration. <laughs> you know, yeah. how do you ensure rigor? How it's, it's a really difficult one, Chris, because we are a bunch of volunteers. We've got one paid member. The, re the rest of us work uh, as volunteers and we can't possibly become an audit and accreditation body. So how do we deal with that? We do deal with it in, I guess, three ways. So firstly, we have those commitments that people have to sign up to, and, and we lose people at the beginning process who say, I don't want to do that publicly. OK. Then we have an application form where we ask quite a lot of detail about the, the firm, and some of those organisations say, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that either. So we lose, lose some of them. And then we have a half hour interview, meeting, discussion with those organisations where we try and take a more of a qualitative view as to their genuineness and authenticity, I guess. So we, ma we manage it in those three ways. Can I sit here and guarantee that we haven't got green, some greenwashing going on in our network? Of course I can't. Can I say that for uh, the best of our abilities, in the best of our time that we've got, we're doing the best we can? Yeah, we, we probably are right now. And as part of the, you know, the interview process and the, kind of the paper-based application form, have you come across firms you said, actually, you're not, you're not ready yet? You know, just come back to go do X, Y, and Z and come back to us in six months? or. Yeah, so we've had some firms that we followed up on. Um, two years ago, we lost about 5% of the members because they weren't doing what we wanted them to do. So we um, you know, agreed that they would leave. Um, we've had some occasions where we've spoken to organisations and suggested they might be better off going down a different route, maybe joining another network, or maybe uh, coming back once they've developed their policy and their frameworks on what they're going to do with measuring emissions, for example. Mm -hmm. So. We, you know, because this isn't a sales growth model, we're not desperate to bring them in and, and sort of turn a blind eye to stuff. We're trying to maintain this authenticity. So yes, we do turn people away, people turn us away, and that's, that's fine because, you know, we, we, we're, we're here to try and do the right thing, not to try and have the best numbers. 
Okay, great. Um, could you give, like, we'd love to hear a bit more about kind of the, the success stories. Like, are there any kind of firms that um, you could talk about that have been, have benefit, have taken, say, inspiration from the network or have taken on new new commitments as a result of just being part of this, these, this, this peer group? Yeah, I mean, there's a few standout members for us, I guess. I've mentioned Toastdale already. So as well as not exporting beer because of the um, the carbon implications, they actually brew uh, using um, leftover bread, basically, to form part of the, 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 the beer. And, and those slices of bread would go into to landfill. So they've got, a, they've got a carbon side, they've got a food waste side, and they're also um, working with a campaigning group to take the government to court over its food waste policy. So I love the way that Toast have sort of picked up those, those three strands. Um, we've got other organisations like uh, Riverford Organics, um, we've got some professional services organisations, we've got some uh, PR and comms companies who are refusing to work with fossil fuel uh, uh, providers, obviously Triodos Bank who won't uh, invest in fossil fuels. Does business class take the credit for that? Absolutely not. That is, is not what I'm saying. But do we, do, do I feel that we've enhanced and um, amplified their message and shared their good practice across our network, which has hopefully been mutually beneficial both to them and to our other members and indeed to us? Uh, yes, I do. So I think it's more around the, the amplification and sharing rather than you know being particularly additive to the goodness that they already have. So. You're obviously you're spending your time and your energies on on businesses, as opposed to an alternative a strategy might have been to to go into 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 politics. Um, do you have more faith in business as a element for for change for 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 transformation than you than you would for, uh, from government? Yeah, I mean, business is generally always ahead of government when it comes to to, to doing things. Um, with plenty of examples from COVID to to, to wherever, um, and. I meet with a lot of amazing businesses who are doing amazing things in spite of the government and the banks, you know, put it, trying to put the brakes on everything. So I have much more faith. Businesses can be a force for good. There is the inherent contradiction between profit and planet. I get that. And, and that's something that needs to be worked through and, and thought through. But there is still goodness to be had in businesses. And we mustn't let p perfection be the enemy of the good, you, you know. Um, so, yes, in, in, in short, um, one thing that businesses need to do more is show some more emotion and I've been to five sustainability conferences in the last year and I can't tell you how much I've been frustrated by the endless talks on methodologies, frameworks, returns, here's a, here's a form for capturing this, here's a method for capturing and sending it back, here's a method for checking that you sent it back, here's a method, you know, we've, we've sort of, there's a lot of intellectualising about what we might do in businesses and it almost feels like a denial distraction process to sort of methodology the hell out of everything i've even had com seen conversations where people are trying to monetize and value the cost of one particular species over another you know all of this stuff needs to stop businesses need to get their voice heard need to take more action needs to need to be bolder um, because we don't have the time not to mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and there's also a, a certain amount of reality that needs to be you know, settling into businesses that you know business as usual is no longer you know we, we can we cannot continue on but one of the one of those issues is that uh, businesses have been focusing in on the the ideas of, of mitigation they've been looking at it because there are potentials for uh, for profit in mitigation so so you can be, you can be making that that sale you we doing we can be be doing well doing good that type that type of argument it's a little bit easier but we're also missing out on um, on the other sides, you know. So on on adapt, adapt, adaptation and resilience, which are much more difficult to be making the profit argument over. How do you deal with those conversations in in businesses? Yeah. So so firstly, I am coming across businesses who are now thinking more about adaptation and how they might align their business to protecting uh, infrastructure and, and, and communities. I'm starting to see that emerge, but, but not, not very much. So, so you're quite right. Most of the effort has gone on uh, decarbonizing or talking about that. And we've been obsessed with that and measuring all that to try and mitigate CO2, uh, some of it to, to good effect and some of it to, to greenwashing. And then we had these, you know, this offsetting movement where you could do some damage over there, but don't worry, it'll be all right over there and everything's good. You know, all, all of that kind of stuff. 
And then, we, and we've forgotten nature. So now we're into nature mitigation, and there's lots of stuff going on about nature, all of which, all of which is good. But the point that I think businesses or a lot of us are missing is that we have already baked in, in massive increases in temperature. And that will hit us regardless of what we do. And that's the science, that's the fact, right? So businesses are really gonna need to start thinking about adaptation. And what does adaptation mean? And for me, adaptation means building community resilience. It means working with a group of people in the communities that you serve as a business, or maybe where your headquarters is, or some other connection, and looking at things like food security. We import half of our food. What's gonna happen when uh, the climate alters uh, crop production, which it already has, by the way. Um, looking at things like energy security, infrastructure security, housing security. So I see the future for businesses as picking up this adaptation arm and running uh, sessions, working with local communities and not asking, how can I make the best profit from this patch of people or this geography, but asking a different question. How can I safeguard the well-being of these people in this uh, in this community and what contribution can I make to them? These are the questions that we need to be asking and I, I'm, I, I haven't yet seen much evidence that were, that, that were there, but it may well be happening and I, I just don't know about it. Mm, yeah, because the argument you'd make would be that without a community, there's no business, so we need Indeed. to be protecting it. It's hard to make a, uh, a, a short-term kind of Quarter, quarterly profit type type argument on that sense, and that's unfortunately the way business is, is wired these days. But um, some of our some of our, our viewers and listeners will be um, within businesses that are just starting down this path. They're starting to think about um, sustainability and thinking about how to make themselves uh, more sustainable. Uh, would it be possible to can, to give kind of you know five simple but impactful things that that a any business can be doing or should be doing? Yeah, I've got a lot to say on this. I'll, I'll, I'll try and sum it into three kind of main themes. So, so the, the first theme is, is what I would call sort of do the basics. So create a space for your employees to be able to talk about this, right? If you're going to constrain conversation and emotion, things are not going to end well. So we need, a, we need a space where people can talk about this freely and without fear of any sort of retribution. And when I say this, I mean the climate, ecological and social breakdown and how they're feeling. The second thing within the doing the basics is to measure your scope one, two and threes, right? You need to measure, you need to know where you are. Not, don't get obsessed with measurement, but you need to know something about it. And then within that, of course, acting on it. And again, acting proportionately. So if you're a small business and you all work from home, focusing all your time on, on man managing down your scope one and twos and maybe even threes is, is, is not a good use of time. But if in that business you advise global companies on whatever you advise them on, that's where you want to put your energies. So acting on scopes one, two, and three, by, and, and of course nature being in there as well, um, is, is important, but do, do it in a sensible way and don't, don't focus on the minutiae. So that's the first chunk of things in terms of doing the basics. Then I say raising the bar. Raising the bar means looking at your corporate governance, looking at how decisions are made, um, looking at all business decisions through the lens of climate and nature. Um, a bit like I said with faith in nature, if you don't change the legals, fine, but at least have that on, on the board. Um, and because you look at those, look at decisions through, through that lens, you will then take action which is slightly um, difficult. So you might look at your supply chain and say, why are we working with these, th this company who are doing this over there? Why are we putting our money with these organisations over there? Um, in terms of a simple, straightforward action under this phase, move the money of who you bank with. If you bank with HSBC and Barclays, if they're in your supply chain, move it tomorrow. And I know that's not easy and you can't do it in one day, but don't have a sustainability department of hundreds and then put your money into the biggest fossil fuel funders because it completely nets it off. So moving money is probably the, the single biggest action that certainly a big corporation can do. And then choosing your customers. How do you turn down a big contract with a firm that may not be seen as good. So do you work with arms producers? Possibly not, that's generally a, a straightforward one. But do you work with companies who fund arms producers? And who are they and what do you do? So there's this whole choice around supply chain and customer. So this is the sort of raising the bar. And then the third thing 
is around speaking up and speaking out, which I've talked about a, a lot today. Get your voice heard, lobby government, lobby your industry bodies, and get your, get, allow your staff out there to, 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 to say what they need to say, because business has huge power, it's got a huge potential to, to be a force for good, but, but we need to have the courage to speak up and speak out. Mm -hmm. Diana, very well said, very well put and very clear. The only thing that might be worthwhile digging into in that that isn't that that wouldn't be immediately clear in, in listening to you, to you from, um, from from our audience point of view would be when you say scope one, two and three plus nature. Like scope one, two, and three, people generally mm -hmm. understand that means you try have to try and look and chase down your carbon emissions of various various par parts of your chain. Um, how then do you do you try and assess the impact of nature within that? That um... you're quite right to pick me up on that, mm -hmm. and um, it's a, it's a really difficult topic because there isn't an easy answer to it. So what what I would say is um, for companies, look at look at your business model, look at where. What, look at what you're producing, where you're producing it, and how you're producing it, and look at how that impacts on nature. So if, you're, if you've got a manufacturing plant somewhere, where does all the waste go? Where does all the pollution go? Where does all the, the runoff of stuff go? Um, if, you've got, if you're building new sites, how are you choosing the sites that, that you build, etc. So there will be a nature element that comes into pretty much everyone's supply chain. If a business says, well, it doesn't because I trade in fine art, so I don't have any nature stuff in there, then you might want to consider spending a proportion of your profit for a nature project, not for offsetting, not for buying up land in some far off place and planting some trees, but actually a bona fide nature restoration project of which there are, are plenty. So those are the kinds of things that I would expect to want to see in a sort of nature strategy, but I appreciate it's, it's not an easy one. Um, one thing that you're a big advocate about are is is, is assemblies, um, kind of the, the kind of deliberative uh, democracy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, well, first off, what is the assembly? So, so deliberative democracy is a is a movement, I guess, that's gaining traction all over the world. It's certainly been used in France to talk about some challenging topics, from insulating homes to to other areas in Ireland to talk about abortion. Mm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a movement and it's a process that's gaining loads of traction and it, it basically involves, um, and by the way, I'm not an expert in this and I've not trained in it, but I have been part of a couple of assemblies. So I'm speaking yeah. from that position of knowledge, not, not the ultimate position of knowledge. Um, it involves a question which a, a group of people will come together on. That question could be something like the, the global assembly that we saw at COP26. The question was, um, how, how can humanity improve the climate and ecological crisis in a fair and equitable way? There's a big question for you. It might be a question in a, you know, in a small town in the UK that says, how can we safeguard the future of our food and, and infrastructure? So whatever the question is, needs to be defined and thought through. So we start with the question, and then the people that come together to debate that question are ideally chosen by sortition, by lot, to represent the community in which they live. And that's a whole other question of, of complexity. But we'll park that for now. So these people come together to address a question. The assemblies would typically start off with some speakers who will provide the knowledge, the facts, the data, that will inform that question. So they're not arguing for one way or another, they're just providing the facts of the matter. And these assemblies, by the way, could be done in two hours or eight weeks. You know, it depends on what the question is and, and how big, how big this, this happens. So then the groups will go off, the, the group will be divided into smaller groups. They will go off and debate the question with a facilitator, make sure everybody's voice is heard. They will come back with recommendations. There will be a, a, a coming together. And then ultimately, they will end up with a, a sort of agreed set of recommendations, which will go somewhere. And that somewhere will depend on what the question is and the setting that it's in. It's a, it's a much more fair and equitable way of making decisions. Um, it's a truth-based way of making decisions because people are informed at the beginning rather than getting their facts from the newspapers, which we all know is, is, is hit or miss at best. Um, and it also builds trust and empathy among people because you're in groups with people, and certainly this is my experience, people that I would never have met in my life before from completely different walks of life. And you get to understand 
different points of view and that may change your perception may may change your view of things so it's, it's a much more fair equitable way and of course because people have been part of the deliberation process they're also very bought into the solution and the action process as opposed to being told this is a solution this is what we're going to do and sorry we you know we, we don't want to talk to you about it that's broadly the concept of of assemblies okay and who convenes the assemblies because obviously the person who is um, setting the facts you know does get to set the direction of the the conversation I think it depends because there's lots of different, um, you know, there's, there's governments could convene them, there's other movements can convene them. Uh, there's a big movement in the UK called the Humanity Project, which um, is uh, creating a team of volunteers in different parts of the UK to convene those assemblies on behalf of the communities that, that they live in. So it depends the scale, the magnitude and, and the scope. But, but as long as it's a, it's, it's a trained, uh, you know, impartial person with a desire to reach a an equitable and fair and democratic conclusion on, on a question, you know, we can all we can all sign up for the training and, you know, r mm. run them ourselves, I guess. I'm not sure I could be impartial in this, though. <laughs> you know, to, to be completely frank, if I was if I was in, I was I was convening one of these, I'm not sure I'd be representing the the, the full the full views of say the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, you know, those views are still valid to, to have in there. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we, we must make sure it's open to, to everyone, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know how these things are dealt with at, at that kind of level. Um, but I, as I say, I'm giving you the, the, the view from someone who's taken part in one and is, isn't trained in one. Fair enough. Um, but you have been looking at uh, business assemblies um, as, as a concept. How do you, so how do they kind of differ? How are they similar? And how do you get businesses voice in there with the understanding that businesses are going to be, any business is going to be more powerful, more influential than any individual just by, yeah. by, by the nature? Yeah. So the question is, how can you pl apply the concept of people's assemblies, citizens' assemblies mm -hmm. to the business world? That's what I've been thinking about looking at with, with various colleagues. Um, there isn't a answer to that, as far as I can tell, in, in the UK, and I'll come on to, to what's going on in France in a second. Um, but ideas could be, if you're an ins insurer, as if you're a pension company, for example, you might get your customers together, chosen by sortition, so it's not just the loudest voices, and you might say to them, we have X billion of your money that we're investing for your pension, um, and we'd like to know how you'd like us to invest it, what things to invest in, what things not to invest in, etc. And you might run an assembly that way, using your customers to inform you. You might also do a different thing. You might bring businesses together in communities um, and say to those businesses, how can you best work with these communities to safeguard food security, energy security, etc. So there isn't an answer yet, Chris, um, but I am passionately believing in the concept of deliberative democracy and its application to businesses. And it's something that we, we, we are, we are going to need to do because I, I do think it's going to happen. In France, the CEC programme is, is doing uh, something like this. It's brought businesses together, I think about 150 businesses over the course of a year in six different sessions. And the, the ultimate outcome here is to create a more regenerative business model. Now businesses are informed of the facts of what's going on. It's also involved elements of government. So there's a policy and there's a regulatory side to it as well. So this is very nascent. The actual movement isn't nascent, but the actual application to the business world is, nas is nascent. Don't have the answers yet, but it's something that we're considering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's certainly a hugely powerful uh, tool. I know I plug from being Irish myself and having seen the impact that it's had. Yeah. Um, on um, some of the, the thorniest issues, like the, the, the issues that you would have thought 20 years ago would be impossible to solve, that you'd never, you'd never have a referendum without have, there have been blood on the streets as a result, have been resolved True. to the general happiness of society, which is really, it's, 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 it's quite something. It really is quite something. So. Um, Good luck. <laughs> so moving along to, to the next issue that we've, we've touched upon a few times, um, the idea of, uh, of degrowth. We've talked about it in the in the abstract, but could you g give a little look? What, what is your particular view on degrowth? On you know where, where we are with really quite controversial mm. topic. Yeah. So also caveat this by saying I'm not an expert, mm -hmm. um, and I am also learning and finding my my way. So I think it's really important to define what we mean by degrowth because there's a 
there's this knee-jerk reaction that it means that we're all going to be unemployed and going back to the caves and, you know, recession and all this bad stuff, which is completely actually the opposite of what it is. Um, there are a number of uh, definitions out there. Um, I particularly like the work of Jason Hickel and Timothée Parikh. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to try and quote them verbatim, but, but Jason Hickel talks about degrowth as a reduction in less necessary forms of production in wealthy countries, rich countries, to get us back within planetary boundaries in a fair and equitable way. Now, those phrases need a lot of unpacking, right? Who says what's less necessary and who says what's fair and who says who's rich? But it's, it's basically a concept that says the stuff we don't need, we really need to downscale and stop producing and we need to upscale the stuff we do need. So degrowth doesn't mean we degrow everything. It doesn't mean we go to the global south and say there's no growth to be had here because that's where we do need to grow. But it does mean we need to grow, go to industries who produce stuff we don't need and get them to reduce or even shut down areas. And this is where it gets horribly controversial, of course, because who's got the right to tell anyone um, what is or isn't needed? But I would offer, I would offer up, do we need private jets? Do we need private jets, apart from humanitarian aid reasons, for the, the wealthy to pop to the shops, you know, to do whatever they do? Do we need yachts? Do we need SUVs, except in um, difficult terrain areas? You know, these are, all, these are all industries. Do we need luxury handbags? These are all industries where we have a massive impact on the planet for stuff that, do we really need them? So, Obviously, that's hugely controversial, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that will come back with, with, with who are you to tell me what I do and don't need, and who are you to tell me what choices and what freedoms I can and can't have. What I would say to them is, um, what about the freedoms of the future generations? What about the freedoms of the people in the global south who are being disproportionately affected right now so that we can have stuff that quite frankly, isn't really necessary. What about those freedoms? So, so there, are, there are arguments and, and counter arguments, but, but essentially it's, it's, it's an upscaling of stuff we need and it's a downscaling of stuff that we don't need to fit into the planetary boundaries and try to create a more sustainable you know, future for, for, for the rest of the world. Yeah, but even without going into those who are you, um, who you tell me type arguments, just the simple fact is like we in the global north are using two and a half planets worth of resources. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. Like it's just that that cannot continue. We've only got one planet to work on. Like there's only a certain amount of time where you keep on digging into into the resources before the you know the bank account's empty before oh, your cupboards are bare. You know, at, at some point we need to kind of come to the realization that. We should be doing things in a sustainable way. Like where we are right now is not sustainable. Like we're we're, we're over consuming massively. You know, I, I I don't know what else to say apart from um, the 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 inherent contradiction between business and growth. Let's call that out. Um, the inherent contradiction between um, people feeling they want to have a choice for stuff and who's going to tell them that that, that they can't. The um, narrative that. You know, you get successful, you earn money, you have the trappings of wealth with your, you know, business class flights and your, your nice hotels, all of which I've had, by the way, um, and I, I call that out. Um, how, do we, how do we get people to, to think differently? Think differently about being, about the essence of being and who they are and what they are and where they want to be. And this is the real psychological challenge, all of this. And, and I would generally come back to people who have got children, people who have got nieces and nephews, um, do you not surely look at them? Do you not surely look at them and want them to have a better life than we are heading to with the amount of warming that is already baked in and will continue to be baked in until governments and banks, you know, change their ways and, and all the rest of it? Do, do you not really care about that for the sake of these things now? And if the answer is, well, no, they can fend for themselves, then, you know, I'm not, not sure what we do. Um, until such time as we run out of stuff and we'll be forced to degrow. Why not get on the front foot now? Why not manage these things now into a just transition into a world where we have much less consumption, much less fossil fuel production in the global north for the rich lifestyles? Why not do that now? Yeah, no, I fully agree. And you can make really strong, personal, emotive arguments to individuals on that, and individuals will, if you've got any, any caring about future generations, you, you know, people will tend to listen and tend to understand. This is all really important. 
But in your, for where you're spending your time now, is you're not talking to, to individuals per se, you're talking to business to business. And the business being the embodiment of, uh, of this, this slightly psychotic personality which only cares about, it, cares about itself and its own, its own very kind of narrowly defined stakeholders, fiduciary duties and, and growth, whatever else. Um, how do you have the conversation with said, okay, I understand you as an individual, you care about this, mm -hmm. but they come back to you and say, well, yes, I care about this, but that's not my job. My job is to look after the fiduciary duty of the business. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a steward of this, of this corporation. How do you get over that? How do you talk to your businesses within your network on this, on these, these subjects? Yeah, well, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we do is convene difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. We've had um, roundtables hosted by the Financial Times, uh, two roundtables with C-suite uh, individuals who are representing their business, not just themselves, but are representing their business because they're on the boards. Um, we've done various sessions at sustainability events with senior people. Um, our main focus, I guess, is education and awareness raising because there's the real tendency to see the word degrowth and go, well, that's not for me because that's not what we do. Um, but when you explain what it is and why we need it, people, it's very difficult to say, no, I don't agree with that. Mm. So awareness raising and education is, is, is the first thing that we talk about. And then the second thing we'll talk about is looking at helping business to look at their, their, their business model. So we might say, you know, look at donor economics and what they do in terms of reviewing the business model and the value chain and look at elements within that where you can uh, see areas that you can make changes. And, and, and if that means downscaling part of your operation, so be it, but do it in a fair and equitable way so that any job changes happen in, in, in the smoothest way possible. So we're at the real early stages of this right now. Yeah, and could you br um, briefly um, describe what donut econ economics is for those of us who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, I mean, do donut economics is taking a whole different look at, at businesses and looking at it from the perspective of the planetary boundaries and the social foundations, um, which, and, and looking at businesses from the perspective of serving people and planet um, first and foremost over, over profit. And, and it takes a, a deep look at the whole supply chain and the value chain of businesses and looks at how it can reconfigure those in a, in a much better uh, and, and, and equitable way for serving people and planet. Um, again, I'm not an expert in this and there are people who can do a far better job than me, but it's essentially it's a regenerative business practice, which is a, a really, strong and you know decent thing to, to do for business but it but it isn't easy and it will raise some very difficult conversations which we have to face into for sure and you've named some like fantastic um academics authors uh, on this uh, on the subject it seems to be that p people have done an awful lot of thinking on the macro level um and um are and understands that what we're doing can't continue um, but have you seen any of that kind of kind of seeping down into businesses themselves? Have you seen any kind of working models for degrowth at the at the level of the firm? Not, I suppose, not not in any comprehensive way. I mean, there, there are lots of good practice out there. I've I've mentioned a couple of organisations. You know, the, the likes of Toast, the likes of Patagonia, the likes of Fairphone, um, Cafe Direct, doing a lot of really good stuff on the social side, um, mm -hmm. as well as looking at their supply chain and where they get their products from, and looking at the nature side. But but you know, to apply degrowth to business right now, I don't think there is a coherent and straightforward answer. Um, but what I do know is we have to find one because the current system that we've got is heading one way and we don't want to go that way. So, you know, we have to find a different way and we have to work out how we bring degrowth into the business world as contradictory as it sounds, yeah. unless somebody can come up with a different option because green growth is not that option. Green growth will still require huge nature depletion, huge fossil fuels to build the wind turbines, the EV batteries and all the rest of it. And unless you're going to cop, couple couple that with degrowth, you know that isn't going to make the, the right difference either. So somewhere along the line, we've got to figure out a way to do it. We, we don't have the answers. I don't know who has the answers, but there's a, lots of people who are wanting to try and work out what they may, may be. Yeah, yeah, but once again, it looks like we're 
they're trying to trying to mix oil and water. Like uh, the people who are fans of degrowth, they're generally speaking not fans of business. Mm -hmm. You know, just a, just as a general rule. Like in the, we can thank the fossil fuel industry for that. But um, and business in general looks at well said my my responsibility is to continue to grow. Like how are we supposed to to get these two really opposing sides to to be to be uh, talking and collaborating? Because there's an existential threat coming down the mm -hmm. line. You know, this is, th this is a war effort that we need, a martial plan that we need. And we have to put aside political differences, ideological differences, business versus academics versus anyone else. Because, you know, we, we face this common challenge, which is near and present danger. Um, we saw it in COVID. People came together in COVID and did all kinds of things that, that we, we wouldn't have thought they did. The difference there, of course, is it was much more immediate, you know, in, infections and, 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 and outcomes, whereas this, this isn't, although it is for some right now. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we, we mobilise against the common challenge, which is the existential threat of the climate, ecological and social breakdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And surely we should have realised that this is, this is happening by now. <laughs> yeah, like really, you're like Mother Nature is, is, is not being subtle anymore. You know, the, all of the warnings are out there, but still, we're not. Um, you know, the the general psyche has not kind of kind of moved across that threshold now to say no. This is this is we understand this. We need to be doing these things. How do we how do we get business to be taking on that to be making that understanding that it's actually it's an accidental threat to to our futures as businesses so it's within our interest to be doing to be taking action yeah well there was a report recently from um the uh, the actuarial body that talked about how we haven't priced in the risks properly of the climate crisis so there's a big bunch of uh detail that's specific to business that's come from a a, a body of people who you wouldn't associate with doomism or calling stuff out who are saying this is happening right now just yesterday uh, network rail announced billions of pounds needed to be spent on upgrading the track because of the climate and ecological breakdown um, businesses are starting to see stranded assets where they have property around uh, places that are, are going to be hit with sea level rise for example there is an entire business case for taking a different stance on this. And it's going to be far more profitable, if you want to use the language of business, to take action now and safeguard as much as you can what you've got, rather than carrying on down the path and then finding that, that you're coming off a cliff. So perhaps we need to use the language of business and talk about ROI and profit and all of that lot. Um, and maybe that will help mobilize people into a, into a different form of action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great start. Ben, we, I could talk to you all, all, all day about this stuff, but uh, I think we're, we're running rapidly out of time. So if we could just, uh, always at the end, the last, last question, just ask for a little bit of advice from, from our guests. And um, I think we've talked a lot about uh, business advice already. Um, so we kind of pivot back to, to where we started, uh, the advice on, um, on, on you having made you know, a big personal transformation. Um, if you could, you give some advice to people out there who are thinking about that that they want to make a big life change. You know, want to make want to make a kind of a big a big pivot, but are kind of fearful or you know, naturally concerned, naturally worried about you know what what, what that would involve. Um, could you kind of give some thoughts about how they should be thinking about making that transition? Yeah. Well, first to say that I was really quite petrified, awkward, um, and really, it, as I said earlier, it took me like 18 months to get my head around all of this. So what I would say is acknowledge that um, this is not an easy thing to do um, and just kind of sit with it and notice that and, and, and work your way through it. But within that, get educated, read stuff um, and talk to people. So, so the first piece of advice would be to, to, to acknowledge it read stuff and talk to people. The second thing would be to know that you're on the right side of history with what you do. And know that if you make these decisions based on values, even though you may not know if your actions are successful or indeed what you might do, but you're making decisions based on values, know that future generations can look you in the eye and, and say, I, I, I can see that, that you've tried to do something there. Um, and in, and in all of that, the third thing I would say is be kind to yourself. 
don't beat yourself up for not doing something uh, that you think you should do or not going quick enough or, you know, um, not managing to find a solution to something. Be kind to yourself because there is, we cannot let perfection be the enemy of the good in this and, and we need to make our best endeavours to our full potential and stretch um, as much as we can. But there are times when we can't, so be good to yourself, be kind to yourself. Thank you very much, Ben. Thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Thank you. It was great. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on that conversation. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you uh, learned something. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and to subscribe to any of our channels and we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.